So before we get started, let me introduce myself. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Flavio Nescu. I'm a delivery manager in, um, in Cognizant Subvision. Um, I have been with the company for the past eight years or so, give or take. Um, and I have been uh, doing this role for the past two years. And during my tenure at Salvation, I have had, I would say, the honor and privilege um, of being a part of one of the greatest um, projects to, on the face of the planet, uh, to be honest. And um, uh, I've seen it um, basically go through its entire life cycle. Well, not entire life cycle, it's still alive and kicking, um, but I've seen it grow from like the meager beginnings when there were only a few a few people around. Um, just so that you can get an idea, it's, it was um, maybe like five people or, or 10 people in a couple of rooms. Um, and then it uh, became pretty big, pretty big. And then um, as all things that go up must come down, it also, um, saw a decline uh, in its numbers, in its scope, in its everything. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, so the, the title of my, uh, of my talk is Toppling a Giant. Um, I know it's a pretty weird word. That's why I added the definition in the bottom right uh, left <laughs> corner of the screen. Just thought it'd be fun to, to see what it means. Um, and uh, yeah, basically it's, uh, it's how everything went down. So um, I guess without further ado, let's just go into it um, and uh, feel free to uh, write any questions while I talk um, in the chat, in the Zoom chat for, for the webinar. I'll try to either incorporate the answers as I go along or um, we'll have some time at the end of, uh, of the presentation so that we can uh, take a few questions. So yeah, by all means, I'm looking forward to, to any inquiries you guys have. All right, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing I want to um, to talk about is at the stage, right? So before we talk about how everything went down, um, I want to uh, make sure everybody gets an, uh, an idea of how big um, this project actually was. So um, I won't give names um, because why would that matter <laughs> in all honesty? Um, but um, let me tell you about how big it was. So this is how big it was. So it, uh, if you look there, it's about 200 icons. Um, don't quote me on the numbers I'm showing here. I'm, I, I rounded everything either up or down so that the images look pretty. But basically we were uh, at the highest point, which was, let's say December of 2019. Um, it was the highest point where this project was in terms of headcount. So we reached almost 200 people that were working on the project. Um, they were spread out um, in a few fields. Uh, so we had uh, many, many teams doing QA, 14 teams to be exact. Um, we were doing both mobile and web uh, testing, performance testing as well, um, manual and automation. We had a lot of guys that were part of the mobile development team. Um, uh, we had several web development teams spread out throughout the country. Um, and then we had some smaller teams here and there doing, um, I, I'd say various tasks, depending on the track that they were a part of. Um, so altogether, yeah, about 200 people were a part of group or of, of the project at its highest, uh, at its high, at its highest point. Um, to give you a sense of the scale of what that means, uh, this is how big the, um, the um, Romania soft vision company was uh, at the end of last year. Again, this is a rough approximation, but basically soft vision was close to, let's say 1800, 2000 people. Um, and the project that I'm talking about was that square in the, in the top left corner. So it's, uh, pretty big considering that Subvision has anywhere between um, um, 100 and 200 uh, clients at any given time. Um, so this was just one of them. Um, it's pretty big, isn't it? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> now that you think about it. Um, so what happened is um, the pandemic hit, right? It's really the sole purpose uh, of, of this very significant decrease that we'll see on the next slide. Um, the client I'm talking about was uh, in the retail business. Uh, its main market was in the US um, and um, it got hit bad by the, by the pandemic. So it, 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 you wouldn't imagine. So they were, there were reductions on their end as well um, within their own company. Um, and obviously they didn't need to be as big as they were. Uh, so they reduced their collaboration with us as well. Um, and it was uh, uh, like the clearest impact. You can draw a clear line between when uh, COVID became a thing that everybody started worrying about and when this uh, decrease happened. If, if you all remember, I think most of us um, from Salvation and, and even people from, from other companies, um, we switched to a work from home um, schedule, I guess, um, around March. Well, the decrease I'm talking about happened in April. So it's, it's like, yeah, that's the reason why. Um, and how it went, it was like this. Basically, um, this is where we were. Right, so the 200 people, everything looks pretty nice. Um, this is what happened after that. So we had to um, scale down um, the teams that we had from almost 200 people to about 40. So that's a very, very significant decrease. And obviously it was very difficult to, to handle from a lot of perspectives, which I'm going to talk about um, in, the next, um, in the next minutes. Um, okay, so um, now that I've let that sink in for a minute, I mean, for me, I don't know what how it looks on your end, uh, but on my end, it's um, it doesn't bring back happy memories, so to say. Uh, but it has been an experience, a learning experience for everyone. So there are um, several sil silver linings here that we can we can think about. Um, Okay, so how did everything go? So the first thing that happened was the client came to us and they were saying, hey guys, we've been very badly hit by, by COVID. Um, we need to take steps to um, cut our costs to, um, I guess, adjust to the new reality that's going on around us. And we need to figure out how, how this is gonna happen. And um, what we need to do, one of the things we need to do is, is we need to, to reduce the, the collaboration that we have with you. Um, it's not something that we did not expect. We did not expect it to be at this scale though. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth in the early days of this, um, trying to decide and to, to navigate, I guess, the how are we um, looking at this from a strategic standpoint, right? How can we make the most of the headcount that we will still have after this reduction happens and um, you know what what are our next steps so there has been some back and forth there um, because what happened what they did at the time was basically um, and consider this from a strictly from a business perspective right I mean if you're an investor and you have a, a stake in a company in a public company the only thing you care about is the bottom line. You don't care about, I don't know, who's doing what and stuff like that. So their initial approach was, okay, let's, let's draw a line here. Everyone who's above the line stays, everyone who's below the line goes. Um, so obviously that was not a very constructive approach and uh, neither myself nor Chilla, who's, who's my delivery director, we didn't really, um, let's say, agree to that approach. So we had a lot of, discussions with the client to try to figure out how to, um, I guess, land on as many of our feet as possible and, and be able to, you know, keep going basically. Um, so, right, this was fun. Um, we had a lot of meetings, a lot of email exchanges um, with, um, you know, various people all the way up to sea level from, from the client trying to uh, determine, I guess, the best course of action. And in the end, there were some concessions that were made. Um, but as I said, their main concern at that at the time was their bottom line and the approach was basically, hey, let's do this now so that we can have something to fix later on. Um, so that's how that went. Um, 
and once the dust settled and I guess we all had a clear picture of what's going on, the next challenge that, that we ran into was figuring out, okay, how do we tell the team? <laughs> um, and unfortunately, um, we had some previous experience on how to scale down a big project. We actually had another project from our group that had a similar fate uh, for similar reasons. Um, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but here we are. And um, we basically got um, everyone together, the, the leadership team primarily, um, and we talked to them. Hey guys, this is coming. We're expecting that the client will... Um, want to you know, scale down, we might see team reductions, we might see some teams being disbanded altogether, which unfortunately was the case. And um, we wanna tell you, right? We want you, to, you guys to know that this is coming. Uh, at the time, we didn't have a clear timeline that became clearer uh, afterwards, um, but it was a difficult conversation to have. I'm not sure um, how how the the leaders from from my team took the the news. Um, it wasn't something that was very easy for me to do, right? Because I never thought that we'd have to you know reach that point so early. I, I guess. Um, so yeah, breaking the news that's that's a that's a hard thing to do. Um, the next uh, the next thing was finger, figuring out how to hand everything over. So. As I said, we had entire teams that were disbanded, right? So uh, basically the from the 40 headcount that was left, we basically um, kept um, a manual QA presence primarily in both mobile and web and some web automation. Um, we stopped doing development, we stopped doing uh, mobile automation, we stopped doing performance testing and we stopped collaborating on the other tracks I mentioned that had their own distinct paths. Um, so a bunch of this stuff had it to be handed over, uh, had to be handed over uh, either to to the clients teams um, where they still had people doing that thing, or to uh, internally between between each other. And there was a lot of uh, documentation, a lot of uh, I guess catching up, knowledge transfer meetings, and stuff like that 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 happened uh, pretty much in a very very short time frame. So everybody just scrambled and. Um, um, and my teams did awesome. I mean, the, the leaders really rallied and they were really able to, you know, hand everything over before they had to, to um, I guess, get out of the project. So uh, a very, I guess, kudos to them. And um, they did a really great job in, in doing this. And the, the teams and the leaders that were um, left within the project, um, they knew, I mean, they were prepared for hard times to come and they did a very good job at absorbing uh, the amount of information that they had nothing to do with up until that point um, and making it part of their, of their day-to-day uh, stuff. So kudos to them as well. Um, and then obviously we had to ramp down the teams. So what that meant, and we'll talk about this in, in, um, in the following slides as well, um, a lot of uh, tasks were interconnected. A lot of the stuff that one team was doing was setting the foundation for the tasks another team was doing. Um, so let, let, let me give you an example, right? So for, um, for mobile regression testing, we had um, a lot, a lot of automation there. Um, and the entire uh, mobile automation team was disbanded. Um, so that meant that moving forward, we would have, we would not have uh, automation support to run our regression tests. So we need to figure, we needed to figure that out, right? How do we do it? I mean, the tests would obviously keep running until they started failing and there was no, no one there to fix them. So, okay, we were set for, I guess, a couple of months. What happens after that? right i mean we'll see a lot of pressure you know building up on top of the regression team to do a lot of manual verifications where uh, previously that was handled automatically so we needed to figure that out um i guess we needed to also figure out um how we um, redistribute the um, I guess the web apps uh, because we had teams that handled specific web applications and then we had to consolidate everything under just one team and we had you know people ramping up 
um, while others were ramping down and uh, doing knowledge transfer internally between them. And yeah, it was fun. And it, I guess it still is. There's uh, still a lot of catching up and we are actually still figuring things out now that we are, I guess, May, June, July, August, four, four almost five months after the fact. Um, yeah, so that was, that was fun as well. And um, it, it wasn't easy, it wasn't easy. Um, so at the same time that everything was going on, we also had to think um, as a company, what are we doing, right? So we had a surge of, of uh, people leaving the project um, and obviously it's hard to find a place for everyone like just by snapping your fingers, right? So the, um, the bench, the bench is the place where people that, that don't, aren't assigned to a project uh, go um, while a project is uh, matched with their skills. So the bench for QA specifically and for development as well, they, they grew, they grew a lot. Um, and, um, you know, just jumping a, a few months ahead, everything's sorted now pretty much. So we are, um, we're in a good, uh, in a good place and we were able to, to assign pretty much everyone to, to other, other projects. But at the time there was a lot of, um, a lot of back and forth uh, in terms of, okay, how do we consolidate the information that we have for these people? Um, and how do we look for uh, new assignments for them? Um, and this was um, a very good, one of the, I guess, best collaborations we've had with uh, all the involved communities in um, coming up with, with you know, a list of everyone that's ramping uh, off the project. Um, what their levels are, seniority and stuff like that. And yeah, obviously all that information is in fusion, all that information can be extracted, but you need to make sense of it because it, it's a lot of data that needs to be um, worked with uh, and it needs to have a common understanding for everyone. Um, so yeah, we, we had a lot of, of documents and, and we kept very close tabs and, and, and we tracked everything that was going on for everyone. Um, we were talking about, okay, who's ramping off? When are they ramping off? Um, what's, what, what options do we have available for them? And um, at, at one point, obviously, everything was handed off completely to the communities. But in the early days, just when, when this thing happened, um, we collaborated a lot in making sure that, you know, we do all our homework and we are able to, um, to know what we are working with. Um, and obviously a lot of very, very solid engineers rolled off group on both, uh, I mean, in all disciplines, um, and, um, a bunch of other projects benefited, you know, from their skills, from their, from their knowledge and, uh, uh their expertise. So it's, it's all good, I guess, at the end of the day, but it was something that we really paid close attention to because it's important, right? I mean, we're not, uh, just playing around uh, here and it's, I guess, it, it's people's like, careers and, and stuff at, uh, that, that's, the, that's the, the stake here. So we really paid close attention to it. And I mean, yeah, we didn't do a perfect job, but I think we did uh, a decent enough job considering the circumstances. So um, yeah, kudos to all the, the CMs and CLs that helped out in, in figuring this out at, at the time. Um, and I guess I already talked about this. So it's basically reassigning the team members. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, a bunch of the, the guys that left that project, uh, we actually picked them back up either, either in um, other projects that, uh, that I also run or in other projects within um, our same delivery group. So that's good because they basically stayed in the family. Um, then we also had, um, people that decided it was a good time for them to, I guess, leave the company. Uh, there weren't too many, there were a few. Um, and we were able to backfill them with people that initially were uh, rolling off the project. Um, so, you know, we tried as much as possible to, you know, keep things healthy and coherent for everyone, even though um, I know how, we, how they looked from the outside looking in, but being in the middle of them, everything seemed very hectic and every day was just, you know, giving a hundred percent and trying to, to keep track of everything. It was, it was interesting. It was interesting times. Um, 
let me actually let, let me just check something here crap um so i wanted to um uh, i forgot to add a slide so i'm going to talk uh, about this before we we go for further so one other pretty important thing here was uh, managing the the morale of people right um, so we've had for people that have been part of this project for a very long time. I mean, I'm talking years here, five, six, seven, eight years. Some people were, were a part of this project longer than I was a part of the project. Um, and I guess you get accustomed to a certain way of doing things. You uh, build relationships with the people that are, you know, by your side day in and day out. Um, you build a, a relationship and trust with the client and you have ways of working and things, you know, just you feel it almost there were days when it felt like, you know, we were like our own, I would say not bubble, but I guess independent, very big pod, right? Um, there was there was there was structure. There was processes. Um, you knew if you had a question, who you would go to ask, and, and we had a lot of knowledge right on, on our hand, on our uh, on our side, I guess, in, in South Vision. Um, so yeah, there was a, there was a morale hit, and, and managing that morale was tricky, right? Because on the one hand, you want to encourage everyone. Uh, you want to tell them, hey, it's yeah, it's uh, not a, a good thing that's happening. Um, but it's not the end of the world, right? We'll be able to move on. Uh, there are so many other positions within the company and you'll have other projects, other opportunities. Maybe you'll move on to more interesting things and stuff like that. Um, but I think that in the same way that, that it was difficult for, for me to, I guess, let go of so many people that, that I have been working with for a lot of years, um, I guess the same thing was felt on the other side, right? When, um, you know, people had to go and they would um, no longer work with the same team. They would no longer have the same leadership. They would no longer have the same reporting line processes and stuff like that. <clears throat> so this is something that um, if I've learned anything, it's that it's very important when a downsizing of this scale happens or any downsizing for that matter. It's very, very important to pay close attention to, to the morale of, of the people that are leaving the project, as well as the morale of the people that are not leaving the project. Um, because, you know, you can reach a situation where the ones that stay may not feel as lucky as you think they should. Um, because, I mean, let's be honest, there was a bunch of stuff that was dumped on, on the ones that, that, that were left in the project. Uh, and they had to adjust. And yeah, this is where we're, we're moving with the discussion on the next couple of slides. Um, but it was also difficult, you know, for the ones leaving because, you know, they, they're moving to new, to new things that maybe they're different than what they were used to and how they were doing them. And I guess um, it's tricky. All I'm saying is just, you know, anyone that, that is in, any way involved in a situation like this in the future, make sure you pay, you pay close attention to morale, as close as you pay to the business side of things. Um, because I mean, if morale goes, uh, it isn't kept in check, it's gonna suck for everyone. Um, okay, let's move on to happier things. So rebuilding the teams. So this was interesting. Let me just uh, shuffle a bit. Um, basically from a, from a leadership layer that counted uh, 14 people, we had to cut down to just uh, five people in a leadership position. And we had to restructure the teams and the team members that, that were left in the project um, with, um, within those, I guess, leadership cones, if, if you will. Um, so rebuilding the teams and redesigning the processes that they go hand in hand. Um, because we had to adjust. I mean, obviously we couldn't deliver the same uh, quantity of work that we uh, were able to before. Sorry, we couldn't um, take on as many, I guess, change requests or special requests as we were able to before. And um, if we wanted to keep the same pace, then we had to decrease volume. If we wanted to keep the same volume, then we either had to decrease pace or uh, decrease quality. Um, and all of these were compromises um, that the client, as well as our teams, uh, you know, we were all aware of this. Um, and we are working towards figuring out a balance on how to, um, 
uh, how to do how to do this. Uh, and there's the negotiation part that I talked in the I, I talked about in the beginning. That's still happening. It's just that it's not, we're not negotiating um, headcount. We're negotiating tasks, priorities, um, work streams, and stuff like that. And um, one good thing that came out of this is that a bunch of initiatives that the client had planned for later dates that were basically, um, let's say in the backlog, they, they moved on, uh, they moved up uh, their timelines by a lot. Uh, one very good example of this is we were able, um, after the decreasing the team sizes, we were actually able to improve our time to market for the mobile app and we are in the process of, um, reworking that for the web apps as well so basically we we moved on from from a three week to a two week release cycle which is um given everything uh that's a huge accomplishment um for, to happen right now um and yeah i mean we we test less we we uh, i guess have a, a bigger workload per individual but all in all uh things are in the process of becoming healthy again. It's still a few months of work ahead of us before we actually reach that point. And obviously the end of the year will be uh, critical in figuring out how, um, how everything will look in 2021. Um, but I guess as long as everyone understands, right, that this is a situation that was, that, that was forced upon everyone due to the circumstances that happened globally, it's not something that was done out of malice or you know whatever other reasons um yeah yeah we'll see so to answer the question where do we go from here so where we what what happens next is we are um looking to get back on the horse basically um so we went through this whole downsizing through this whole ordeal uh, almost of uh, making sure that uh, we still stay functional and i think we've uh, managed to accomplish this successfully um and um we're looking ahead to what comes next um signs are promising uh, and uh, hopefully we can i guess rebuild this to the scope and size that it was before um We'll see if that happens. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about it, but um, I guess it's, it's something that we'll all have to learn. And hopefully next year, um, this time, I'll be able to talk to you guys about how we uh, recovered from, uh, from the, the situation with, where we, uh, in which we are right now. Um, Okay, so I guess I guess this was it. I know that I, I barely scratched the surface uh, in terms of information and um, I didn't want to go too in depth into the challenges that, that happened um, because quite honestly, I'm always running out of time and I guess I overcompensated a bit too much uh, right now. So I'm curious if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask at this time so um you can only use the the, the zoom chat function uh, for that but uh, feel free to to do it and i will uh yeah sorry the qa function the q a yeah, i know what i said <laughs> um so yeah feel free to to shoot the question there and i'll uh, and i'll answer anything that comes along and as i i, I was talking to uh, my uh, my leadership group before this session and I told them that uh, if they have a question that I can't answer I'll just basically buy them a crate of beer so that goes uh, to everyone else if you have a questions that I that I have to say hey I need to go and research the answer before answering um, you get the same deal so that's that there's an incentive for you Okay, so there's nothing. Uh, all right, perfect then. 
Uh, well, I mean, if there is anything uh, that comes up, uh, that comes to your minds later on. Oh, hang on. It, it seems like I have a question. Where do I have a question? I'm not seeing it. Oh yeah, hang on, I have it. Oh, there we go. Things are looking up. Okay, um, so chances, chances to get back to the initial size. Um, I think I already covered this, so there's always chances. Uh, everything is about the bottom line at the end of the day. If the client um, has a successful year and a successful, um, I guess, uh, Q4 uh, earnings report, then the answer is a strong yes. If the, they don't, then the answer is a strong maybe. So we'll see. As I said, I'm cautiously optimistic about this. And what was the hardest thing that, uh, that I had to do? The hardest thing that I had to do was, um, I think it was more of a personal thing, uh, is basically not lose it. Um, so I, I've been very invested in this, in this client and in this project and uh, a bunch of my plans and, and things that, that I had lined up for this year went down the drain basically when, uh, uh, when this reduction happened. So uh, yeah. Uh, I had to to realign myself to the new reality as well. Uh, at the same time, making sure that uh, you know we don't do too much damage to the to the guys that uh, that are a part or were and still are a part of the project. Thanks, Marianne, for the question. <clears throat> okay, there's uh, another question that I just got is, were there any changes in the workflow? Yes, there were a lot of changes in the workflow um, and we are still implementing those changes. Um, we've reduced uh, uh, testing, we've reduced, uh, um, I guess, how often we take uh, special requests, we've reduced how we handle team meetings, we've reduced our involvement in, um, in a bunch of initiatives that we jointly owned with the client. Uh, and I, yeah, and uh, I guess we, we focused a lot of making sure that the, the stuff that we deliver gets delivered at the same quality level. Um, and obviously to make time for that, we had to uh, take time from, from another place. How was your morale? Uh, thanks for the question, Julia. How was your morale during the whole thing and how did you manage it? Um, drinking. <laughs> um, morale was, was fluctuating a lot and I think it, it's, uh, it was true for everyone. Um, but handling morale is a tricky thing, right? Because you, you don't want to be overconfident when, when the situation isn't and you don't want to allow yourself to, to fall, um, to go down a rabbit hole where, uh, you know, you feel just, I guess, uh, bad feelings um, when, again, you need to be professional about things. So I have guess I've had the same approach that I've asked everyone from, from the project and from my teams to have is just, I guess, stay, um, try to, to think of this as a thing that happens in our field and it happens a lot. Uh, probably doesn't happen at this scale too often, but it does happen pretty much every day. You know, projects get reduced, teams get canceled and stuff like that. Um, and just look forward to the next challenge and, you know, practice the skills you learned um, and try to make, uh, I guess, the world a better place. Um, and at some point, inevitably, everyone will, will meet again. Um, Cool. Uh, how did you keep the same quality but test less? How did you innovate? Um, so this is an anonymous attendee, so I don't know who to, who to thank for the question. Uh, we kept the same quality by uh, refocusing what we test. So uh, we decreased our scope. Before we used to test pretty much everything. It was almost exhaustive testing. Um, and um, we were forced to come up to be creative about it. And, and we basically reduced uh, testing to the core areas that were core functionalities and that were important for the product itself and that um, were bringing the, mo the most revenue to the client. Um, and we made those as, as good as we could. 
Um, and we basically stopped testing the ones that even if something bad happens in those areas, the impact isn't big, right? So it's basically a, a case of we reprioritized uh, all, our, all the work we did and uh, we focused on the highest priority items exclusively. And Marianne with second question, how was the quality impacted? Let's say percentage now uh, when the team was reduced, how did this change the focus of the engineering product? Um, so what happened there um, was there, be, because we lost a lot of development uh, headcount as well, and because the, the client also had uh, downsizing on there and, and that was pretty aggressive, uh, the amount of new functionality that came in reduced uh, dramatically. So I think in that, in that respect, everything balanced out pretty nicely. So there was less uh, feature development, uh, less, uh, I guess, code changes that were happening across all the platforms. Um, and I guess they, let's say they, they decreased by more than 50%, just to, to give you a, a ballpark percentage here. Um, so the team was able to handle that. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the answer, I think. Um, um, and uh, similar to, to how we, we changed our testing approach, the, the client changed their engineering and product uh, focus as well. They stopped developing any number of you know, smaller or quality of life features, so to say, and they focused on the core functionality. Um, that's what they delivered. That's what we tested. And, you know, I guess the, the main focus for everyone right now is on the um, things that provide the most value uh, right now. Um, and why the web automation continued to be a thing, but not the mobile automation? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think the answer is, um, is value, right? The value that they were providing. It's not that the mobile team was not providing, the mobile automation team was not providing value. It's a case of the mobile team had a lot, the mobile automation team, they had a lot of manual backup. So the, the thought process here was that even if we um, decrease um, our presence in the mobile automation field, we still have uh, a significant number of manual QA that can pick up those tasks until we decide what we want to do. It wasn't the case for web. So web was a lot more balanced in terms of manual versus, uh, versus automation um, engineers. And um, so the reduction there happened in a more balanced way as well. So we did have a reduction in, in, in manual uh, engineers for web. Uh, we also had a reduction in automation engineers for web, but it was more balanced than it was for mobile for precisely that, re that, that reason. Um, j just to, to sum it up, let's, let's say that for web, we were basically one-on-one -on -one manual with automation. For mobile, we were three to one. So it, 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 that, that was the, the rationale be behind the, the reduction for mobile automation and not for web automation. Uh, and another question from, from Marianne, would you recommend same effort to be invested in testing for a new product after seeing how the product quality is affected by not doing yes, but not by not doing a full exhaustive testing? Yeah, I think, uh, but th this is tricky, Marianne, right? And for everyone is you need to align with the, with the client because if the client wants to do exhaustive testing and yeah, we as consultants, we can say, hey, you don't need to do that. Let's, let's, uh, use something from our playbook that we've used before and it works, then if the client is adamant that they want that, then we can implement that. But yeah, for new clients, I would definitely recommend and I would suggest that, um, you know, some time is spent evaluating the key areas of the product and really look at, at how, um, what the impact from a financial standpoint is for those areas and the ones that bring in the, mo the most revenue, those are the ones that we need to focus on, even though, even if they may be the, the, the most boring ones or the um, ones where you need to do, uh, I don't know, things that are redundant and, and stuff like that. Uh, and maybe they're not innovative and, and, and things like that, but you need to align yourself to the, uh, and you need to align both QA and development to the, um, 
to what earns you know basically money for the for the client and for the product and another question from Koto. Uh, how would you rank the client's reaction now that everyone is more adapted to the pandemic situation do you think it was out of necessity or just out of precaution preparing for the worst i think uh honestly i think it was a mix of the two so they were reactive they were reactive and i think they went overboard this is my personal opinion i think they made some um some decisions which could have been um thought of a little bit better um i think they also had some uh plans of uh cut cutting some fat let's let's say uh, both internally and in terms of their collaboration with uh, with contractors and consultants and stuff like that. And I also think that they were, uh, I guess, uh, profiting from the situation to reinvent themselves and become leaner, more agile, um, able to, to, you know, move faster because they were getting like this, they were becoming this huge thing that moves slow and they wanted to go back to, to where they started and where they could you know, move very fast and make changes uh, extremely quickly. And yeah, I think that's, that's the answer to that question. Okay, then um, as a, let's say a, a final uh, conclusion to, to everything is, I mean, not conclusion, just in case anyone still has questions or, or feels like they would, um, want to find out more about this whole thing that happened and how we handled it and um, I guess how things were thought of, what the, the planning was, what the strategy medium and long term looked like and, and things like that. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find um, both internally and for external atten attendees. So um, yeah, I'm pretty open to taking questions. Um, and I hope I'll have you know, good answers for you as well. Okay, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I don't want to go over the allotted time. There's a bunch of stuff happening. There are a lot more talks in this programmers week and I uh, encourage you to attend as many of them as possible. We have a lot of great speakers, um, pretty solid keynote speakers as well uh, that I will be personally attending as well. And um, take advantage of, of everything that's going on this week so that uh, you, know, you get the most out of it. It's really a, a very cool event that, that Salvision has been doing for the past few years. Um, cool, thanks a lot for joining and uh, talk to you guys soon. Bye, have a great day and a great week.